All right, now we're going to talk about how life exists and kind of uses our tidal zones as a place, a great place to live and to make their livelihood. So we're going to be taking a deeper look. Um, all right, now we're going to take a look at marine life in our tidal zones. Um, now, if you were to go and think about the tidal zones, um, there are a couple things that we're going to look at. We're going to start by taking a look at our tidal pools. So tide pools. Um, we're also going to talk about sandy beaches and we're also going to talk about um, a little tiny fish called the grunion um, and how they use the tides to interact. Um, now, if you've ever been out to an ocean, um, especially our rocky um, coastlines at places where you have rocks extending down into the water and they're partly covered by the high tide and partly exposed during the low tide, you can go and explore these areas and you find tons of life. And what we find out is that our tide pools, um, while in a very extreme environment to live, are some of the most diverse marine ecosystems that we find. So these exist in our rocky intertidal zones. Um, and then, um, so this, we can think of it as this whole community. Um, and when we go out to these areas, if you wanted to try to visualize it, uh, you could draw sort of a profile. I'm just going to try to give it some bumps um, as it goes out to the sea. So it's rocky, solid rock. It will have flat areas and some high surfaces as you go out into the deeper water. So we'll have our water out here and in this case this is all exposed so this would be a very um, a very low tide um, probably a very low spring tide so when we go and start to look at these areas what we find is we can divide them into different zones i'll just draw some lines here and then this bottom one would be here at the bottom so in this top zone, zone number one, what we find are a lot of lichens and cyanobacteria. Um, to kind of a viewer looking at this, it's going to just look very rocky and it might be kind of hard to actually see anything. Um, not a whole lot, it's mostly exposed. So we can see it's highest up on the profile. So overall, when we look at that tidal range, this is going to be exposed more of the time and just covered by water a little bit of time. So it's definitely um, kind of drier at the top. In the second zone, just down a little bit, we find a lot of red algae. Okay, in the third zone, we're going to start to see our mussels and barnacles. Okay, now we know these organisms, they um, can handle some exposure. So they have shells, they're able to close up and seal up, but you know, they do have limits for how long they can be exposed like that. And they are attached, um, so they're sessile. They're going to be attached to the rocks. They can close up. But again, when we look at this, they're in a zone that has more moisture than the zone above. Okay, and then down at the bottom in our fourth zone, we have our sea stars and our sea anemones. Okay, and then when we think about these, these definitely have a higher moisture content or need. Um, so they're going to be in the area that has the least exposure. So um, if you wanted to kind of think about this, this would be the drier and we'd have increasing uh, wetness, so wetter um, areas. So kind of a smaller range of exposure to a higher range of exposure. Now, basically, if you're trying to wonder kind of what is this whole area, this is all part of the intertidal community. Um, so intertidal, this is the place on the shore. It can be rocky or sandy um, that exists between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide. So it's that zone that gets splashed as the tides rise and fall. Um, so it's a band, if you will, on the shore between highest high and lowest low 
okay? Um, so to live here, um, organisms have to be equipped for this very extreme environment. They have to be able to deal with um, uh, wave shock, which is just the pounding of the waves coming onto the shore. So they have to be able to handle that impact. Um, organisms can deal with wave shock by having special shells that are designed. So we see lower profile shells, um, so flatter shells, smoother shells that won't be, um, that will be able to withstand the impact a little bit more and not get them knocked off from their positioning. If they are sessile animals, which means attached, we're going to start to see very intricate attachment systems. So they'll have ways that they cement themselves down to uh, the substrate, whether it's the rocky areas or maybe they figure out ways that they can attach to a plant or something, an algae. Um, so they have ways to attach themselves uh, to deal with that and being prevent being ripped off. Um, they can also, if they are motile, they can swim away or they'll change their positioning um, to try to avoid that major wave shock. They also have to be able to deal with temperature, uh, salinity, and I'll just write moisture extremes. Okay, so we know at our shorelines, um, these are places where they can go through some, it can be hot and it can be cold. If they happen to be more in a polar environment, it can even get to freezing temperatures right on the edge. Uh, salinity will change. Our shorelines do have an input of fresh water. Um, if we have a river system nearby, um, they also will just go through a, a change in salinity as the water um, goes out during the low tide. If you have a pool that's left behind that starts to experience some evaporation, the water left behind will have an increase in salinity. So they need to be able to deal with those changes, both kind of in the extremes in both directions. And then as we've pointed out here, moisture extremes, how do you deal with just going through periods of being totally exposed if you have lots of soft tissue that you need to preserve that moisture. So things that we see uh, dealing with that, especially with this moisture, the big risk is desiccation or drying out. Um, so organisms have shells like these mussels and barnacles that they can close up. Um, sea stars and sea anemones. If you've ever picked up or touched any of these things, sometimes um, I'm thinking of actually like a sea cucumber. If you ever get to touch one, uh, they are, they feel slimy. Or if you're at the beach and you find some algae and you pick it up, you might notice that it has kind of a, a slimy mucusy feel to it. Well, that mucus actually helps protect their tissues during those periods of exposure at the low tides. All right, um, and um, ultimately things will, um, we look at kind of just the construction. So shells, mucus, and then just being able to maybe be positioned in a spot that maybe utilizes your greatest strengths so that you can survive the best. Now, given all of this, you might be wondering why in the world would an organism live in this environment? Um, and the reality is it is a very diverse area, so we know that it's a great place to be. Um, and that's because it's a place where there's lots of nutrients. Organisms need nutrients in order to survive, so we have water the breaking of the waves starts to make sure that there's enough dissolved oxygen for all of our organisms. Um, we have an increase in nutrients kind of getting flushed in from the ocean. We also, in our coastal areas, will have streams bringing in nutrients from the continents. So it's a great place, lots of nutrients that allows all of this life to exist. Um, and ultimately, because we have this variation in topography, there are a lot of places, nooks and crannies, different environments and niches for organisms to really make a life for themselves. All right, so that's looking at our rocky intertidal communities. Now, another place that deals with tides is just along our sandy beaches. So we'll quickly kind of put that up here and talk about it. three organisms that hang out and along our sandy beaches. Okay, now just like our rocky zones, so if we draw a sandy beach, we can have our waves coming in. 
Uh, the zone that we're looking at again um, is this point where we have our high tide and our lowest tide. So it's this zone between the high, the high tide mark and the low tide mark. This vertical zone in between experiences that change in moisture uh, during the day. So this is our intertidal. Our intertidal zone. Now there are a couple of organisms that what they do is they just hang out here and they migrate up and down with the change in the tides to make the most of their environment. Again, they have to deal with wave shock, they have to be able to deal with desiccation, and then those changes in temperature and salinity. And then three organisms sort of stand out that really use this zone really well. Um, the first would be our fiddler crabs. Now, if you've ever watched any documentaries, the BBC has some great ones with these fiddler crabs. You know, they got one big claw and one little one, and they, they run up and down. What these do is that they use the tides to their advantage. When the tide is high, they burrow. They go down into their burrows and they hide out, and, when, and that way they're avoiding predators. So fish will swim in here during the high tide, and they're looking to pick up anything they can eat. When the tide goes out, the fiddler crabs will pop up out of their burrows and then they start running up and down the beach, scavenging anything that's been brought in by the tide. This can include dead fish who might have been their predators, and they make the most of it. When the tide comes in, they will pop back down into their burrows and they'll just wait it out. All right, the next two that we're going to look at are our emerita, which are our sand crabs and donax, which are the bean clams. Now these are two that you might have seen if you've ever been to the beach and kind of walked around while the waves are coming in and out. Um, these two organisms will actually start to come out and they move up and down to make sure they're staying in this tidal zone. So emerita are little tiny crabs. Um, they have a hard shell on the back and little feet um, and they will come out and they kind of, well, you'll notice them as the tide is going out, they'll start to burrow in and they're basically avoiding that incoming wave. But then once it's up, they float around and they're catching and they're filter feeding. So they're trying to get as much nutrients and food out of the water as it's flushing back and forth, but they burrow down. So it's a great fun. Um, I remember as a kid, we would just go and look at these beaches and you would look for these as the waves would be going in, you would see these like V marks. And what those Vs were caused by is the sand kind of moving away, but the burrow would be up here and we'd go and dig them out and get handfuls of these little tiny uh, sand crabs um, in the beach, so right in this zone. Donax is also very similar. These are small clams, so they have two shells and they have siphons that come out that they use to pull in water. They move it across their gills and then they excrete it back out after the waste water after they're done. So they need to be in a place where that water is always located, but they also need to avoid that wave shock. So when the waves are coming in, they will have burrowed down. They have a large muscular foot that they use to kind of get down into the sand. Um, but then as the waves are going out, they will pop out of their burrows and they'll kind of slide down the beach or tumble down the beach with that outgoing tide. And then they're going to stick out those siphons. And you'll notice that if you ever see them, you'll watch, they'll have two little siphons come out and one's pulling the water in, pushing it out. And then as soon as the waves are going down, they notice it and they start burrowing back in to avoid that incoming push of the wave. So those are organisms uh, in our sandy beaches that deal with this intertidal zone. Now the last uh, organism I want to talk about um, is one that times its reproduction with the tides. And these are our grunion. Okay, so uh, I like to write, think of them as grunion runs. So this was something that you can go and try to check out um, at some point. A grunion run are people going out to look for these organisms um, that are reproducing during these spring tides. So they're uh, small fish, and I'm gonna write this down. It's 
Lorethes would be their, um, there's an S right there, <laughs> is their name. So these are small fish. And for size, they're about six inches or 15 centimeters long. Okay, they live out in the oceans. Um, and what they do, um, the name grunion is from the Spanish word grunion, which means grunting. Because these fish, when they come ashore and they're starting to spawn, they can occasionally be heard making a noise that's sort of a squeak or a grunting noise. So that's where their name comes from. Basically, these are found along the Pacific coast of the U.S. Um, so definitely down in California and farther north, they can be found down um, in the Gulf of California and um, the Baja California coast down in Mexico. And they spawn in, from late February through early September, okay? And what they do um, is they time their spawning for a few days after the spring, the spring tide. And of those, they're looking at the highest spring tide. So if it's in a place that has a semi-diurnal tide, they're gonna wait, it'll be during the spring tide, but the, right after the highest of the high tides that comes in. Okay, um, so basically what they do is they kind of wait it out. Um, people that go on the grunion runs will sort of time it. You might have to go out several nights in a row before you see it, um, but the fish will swim onto shore um, and then they deposit eggs and the eggs are fertilized with sperm. The eggs are then left on the shore and the fish kind of flop back down and out into the ocean. And then you might hear them grunting to get their name. Um, so that happens, the fish go away, eggs are left on the beach, and then the eggs will start to develop. They're ready to hatch nine days after they are deposited, but they don't hatch until the return of the spring tide about two weeks later. So the eggs hatch, and then the fish go back uh, to the ocean. So those little baby fish return to the ocean and then they develop. Um, so ultimately this is a fish um, that uses the tides to their advantage. By putting their eggs up onto the beach, the eggs are less likely to be preyed upon by fish. So eggs are lots of nutrients in an egg, definitely is an easy source of food if you're another fish swimming around. So leaving your eggs up on the beach, especially um, you know, they've done it during the spring tide. So they're up pretty high on the beach. When the tides go back out, when the water returns, those eggs are still going to be left in that moist sand kind of underneath the, the top layer. Um, and then they won't hatch until the water comes back up, tells those little eggs, hey, it's time to hatch. They hatch very quickly and then they swim out to the sea. So it's a very good um, kind of way to avoid predation for your offspring. So now it's not actually known exactly how the grunion know that they should go and spawn. Um, so some people think that they're looking for a visual cue and they're looking for with a new or full moon. So that's one option. Um, the second is looking at um, hydrostatic changes. related to pressure with the incoming and um, outgoing tides. So those are the two possible explanations, but again, nobody knows. So if you are wanting to get into the field of marine biology and want to tease us out, this could be a fun topic to try to go into and focus on. Uh, that's it. That's all I have for some examples of how life exists in and around the tidal zones um, and how the tides affect uh, the marine communities.